Okay. Okay. Hi there, everyone. My name is Fahad. I'm one of the final year medical students. Um, and today I'm just presenting um, one of the cases I saw recently. Um, so this patient I clocked and I examined, and essentially he was a 37 year old male who was referred to the clinic following abnormal blood test results in Greece. Um, so he's Greek and he's just come back from holiday about a month ago. And the main thing that he presented with was swelling of his left eye. Um, on further questioning, he told me that, that he's had it for a year. Um, he didn't actually notice it, it was his mother and, it's, um, and his vision has been gradually worsening over time. However, he didn't uh, associate this with the swelling. He said his vision has been getting worse for multiple years now. Um, he did say uh, that he had slight double vision, but this wasn't constant. It only came and went and was most prominent when he looked from one place to another very rapidly. Um, he wears glasses normally and he has his, uh, most of his life, but there were no other eye symptoms that he reported, such as dryness, any redness, any pain um, or anything like that. And his main other concern that he presented with was with um, lethargy. He said that he's been feeling more tired recently. It's been affecting his work. He works as a chef and um, he was wondering if it was connected to the eye. OK, um, on further questioning, he said that he had no flow symptoms. So this was essentially no fever, less, um, except, except lethargy, um, no changes in appetite, weight loss, um, or any night sweats. Um, he said that sometimes he's got slightly loose stools and um, sweaty palms, but the only two things that could get out of him, but that was after significant further questioning. Um, OK, so if I open that, I mean, what does flow stand for? Uh, fever, lethargy, appetite changes, weight loss, and um, night sweats. And these are like the symptoms we look for like when investigating neoplastic. Uh, okay. Sounds like a bit like lymphoma, but okay. Yeah. But he had none of those symptoms except lethargy. Um, and he said that he's had no recent viral illness abroad or here. Um, nothing of note in past medical history, except like a slight an anemia that he took iron supplement for 15 years ago, but he stopped since then, not on any medication or any drug allergies. Um, and he said that his grandparents died from neoplastic causes. Um, he wasn't exactly sure what um, the cancers were. Now, in terms of social history, he's a chef. He said that he works six times a day, uh, six weeks, six days a week, um, and he smokes nearly uh, 10, to six, 10 cigarettes a day, and he's been smoking for the past 25 years. Um, he regularly drinks alcohol around 10 pints of beer per week. Um, he smokes every single day. Um, he smokes cannabis every single day, three times a day. Uh, combined with his cigarettes, um, doesn't have any children or spouses, living with flatmates, um, and he claims that he's been overweight most of his life, but he is trying to lose weight, um, which hasn't been successful so far. We examined him, um, his obs were, heart rate was fine with, at 82, respirate was 16, which was also fine, and blood pressure was fine, 139 of 87. Um, on cardio, resp, abdo, and upper limb and lower limb examinations, I could note any no, I couldn't note any abnormalities. However, when I did examine in the cranial nerves, um, it was very obvious that he had a unilater unilateral exophthalmos um, on the left-hand side. And he reported double vision that was only present on the lateral upward gates on the left and right-hand sides um, when I did the H test with eye movements. But apart from that, he didn't know any pain or anything like that. I went on to do a thyroid examination. So there was no fine tremor, um, no palpitations, but, and no goiter present in his neck either. We then looked at the bloods that the GP had sent over and his T4 in Greece was 54. And as you guys can see from the reference range here, that is significantly higher. Um, and his TSH was suppressed, which will go through why that might be. That may be. Um, and then the GP repeated the T4 about uh, two weeks later and his T4 had significantly come down to 20.2, which was in the range, but his TSH was again suppressed. Uh, we ordered blood tests and the most recent TFTs uh, showed that the TSH was suppressed um, and the T3 was slightly high. But most importantly was that, uh, I mean, uh, the T3 was nearing the high end of the range. But most importantly, the TSH receptor antibodies were positive at 5.7. And um, we will discuss why that was very important.
And essentially, as you guys can see here, he's 37 years old. So he's nearing the age that the diagnosis is normally made, which is between 14 and 16. However, he didn't present with the classical symptoms that you get with hyperthyroidism. And we can discuss why that wasn't so. Um, however, Graves' disease is just one of the causes of hyperthyroidism. Essentially, Graves' disease is an autoimmune disorder that causes hyperthyroidism. So essentially too much thyroid hormone um, and was discovered by this chap here, Robert James Graves. Um, so essentially, it's a B cell mediated condition. Um, it doesn't have a trigger. And however, it is um, commonly associated with um, a family history of the disease. And when I further questioned him, he did reveal that his mom had thyroid issues, which was which proved to be important. Um, however, um, and can be accompanied with other autoimmune conditions. And it essentially leads to the production of these thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, which um, stimulate the TSH, so the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor, which lead to the production of excess thyroid hormone. This leads to a negative feedback loop affecting the anterior pituitary, decreasing the level of TSH produced. So as you guys can remember, his TSH was suppressed, but his thyroid hormone was in excess. Um, so this would explain why that might be. Now, in um, high Graves' disease, you also get the production of a goiter. Now, this is essentially due to the fact that the constant stimulation of thyroid gland leads to the hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the follicular cells, as well as um, expression of antigens which attract T cells, and the infiltration of the T cells into the interstitium can lead to the increased size of the goiter, as we, you would see in um, a thyroid exam on the neck. And finally, um, it's classically known um, that it is a triad of symptoms, which essentially presents with hyperthyroidism, um, ophthalmopathy, and demopathy. Um, and some people also talk about thyroid acropathy, we could, which we can discuss at the end, but that is uh, much rarer compared to these. Okay, so first of all, hyperthyroidism. Now, these, this presents with the classical symptoms of too much thyroxine, which essentially leads to an increase in basal metabolic rate. So one of some of the main symptoms to note here are the insomnia, the irritability, the increased heart rate and the arrhythmias. Um, what he had was slight diarrhea. If you guys remember from the history, he had like a loose stools recently. Um, and he had the warm, moist skin and the palms when I questioned it. But apart from that, he didn't look very hyperthyroid from his history. Um, and another part of the triad is the dermopathy and most commonly pre-tibial mixed edema. Now, essentially, this is due to um, the TSH, the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin that is produced, which impacts the fibroblasts in the skin, leading to production of gag chains, which are essentially glycosaminoglycans in the extracellular matrix. And uh, this is normally uh, bilateral. Um, it's erythematous. It's, um, it's described as a powder orange texture, so like an orange peel texture. Um, and it also it has hyperhidrosis, so it's more sweatier than the surrounding areas. But from what I could determine, unless it goes down into the feet and ankles and affects people putting on their um, like shoes and socks, it's not really painful and mostly is treated for cosmetic, region, uh, cosmetic re uh, reasons only. However, one thing to note here is that it's very rare without um, ophthalmopathy. So without the eye um, presentations that are common in Graves' disease, um, it's very rare to see this just alone. So this is a very rare presentation of Graves. Now to the crux of the matter, thyroid eye disease. So essentially, the reason he had the exophthalmos and the double vision, like I said, the B cells produce the TRAB, which is the thyroid um, antibodies, the thyroid receptor antibodies, which impact orbital fibroblasts. Now, fibroblasts lead to the production of gag chains, which are um, anionic polysaccharides in the extracellular matrix, which deposit behind the eye, leading to the protrusion. Now, just some detail about the protrusion itself. So there are three parts of thyroid eye disease. One is that there is inflammation. Secondly, there is uh, the gag chain deposition. And lastly, it's the um, adiposynthesis. So there is synthesis of excess adipose tissue. These three things combined lead to the classical symptoms. Now, in terms of TED, there is different severities. It normally starts with um, eyelid retraction. No, sorry, no symptoms. And then it can be mild 
with eyelid retraction, then protrusion, and then it can lead to the thickening of the rectus uh, muscles on the side, which can cause pain on movement. And lastly, can lead to corneal ulceration and eventually damage the optic nerve, which can lead to blindness. So there is a range of presentations people can present with in TED, um, but the patient that we had was very mild. He only had the protrusion um, without any of the other symptoms. Now, uh, this is called the Rundle's curve. And essentially what it says is that unlike other autoimmune conditions and inflammatory conditions, thyroid eye disease is self-limiting. So essentially it has two phases. One is the active phase or the acute phase. And the second is the inactive phase. So the acute phase leads, starts with inflammation and leads to all the symptoms that I just spoke about. So the protrusion, the eyelid retraction, um, but for some reason, that they don't know the inflammation stops. One of the uh, proposed theories that I read about is about um, how the eye doesn't have any lymph tissue. So due to the lack of lymph tissue, there's no lymph neogenesis. So there's no uh, reason for the inflammation to continue without the lymphoid tissue. That's just one of the theories. Um, so it's self-limiting self and then is followed by fibrosis which is a much longer uh, part of the phase but it does not lead to deterioration of the symptoms. You start off with conservative management when it comes to thyroid eye disease. So these are prisms that you can put in their glasses to fix the double vision. Head elevation to maybe reduce the pressure. When they're sleeping, ask them to retract their eyelids physically so the eye doesn't dry out. Um, selenium, which um, I've heard different varying opinions on. Um, some say that it is significant, um, significantly decreases the progression from mild to moderate disease by reducing the inflammation itself. And from the literature, um, what I could gather was that it actually physically reduces the inflammatory cytokines in the eye, leading, which was one of the reasons for why TED develops. And of course, if it gets really bad, we would then progress on to systemic corticosteroids, but that, that's in acute situations. Um, now, the main thing, as many of you may know, that you give for hyperthyroid patients is carbimazole. Um, 40 milligrams tightened down once you thyroid. Or, so it can be given in two ways, either titration down from 40 or a block and replace regimen, which essentially consists of giving a high dose continuously, which wipes out the thyroid gland and then giving replacement thyroxine alongside it. Now, carbimazole essentially is, if you guys can see my mouse, um, is a thionoamide. So it works by inhibiting the perioxidase enzyme in the thyroid gland. It provides it with an alternative substrate. So the uh, TPO enzyme is unable to carry out the iodination, therefore reducing the amount of thyroid hormone production. So essentially, its main role is to reduce the production of thyroid hormone rather than interfere with the thyroid antibodies that we... Um, discussed earlier. Um, and loss, um, and importantly with carbimazole, it's important to let the patient know that they, uh, one of the main side effects that it could have uh, is neutropenia. So a reduction in their white blood cell count, neutrophils. Um, so just to be aware of that. Um, one of the things I noted was the emphasis, I was with one of the consultants, that they put on why they should stop smoking. So I researched that further. And the reason why it's advised for patients to stop smoking if they have thyroid eye disease um, is because smoking has shown that it not only um, reduces the effectiveness of the treatment, but it leads to the progression of the symptoms. So here is a study that they did. And essentially, so this is a thyroid autoimmune ophthalm, um, ophthalm, ophthalmopathy patients and control subjects. So people with, so in the black is TED eye disease, and those are controlled. And as you can see, there is a dose dependent relationship. The more people smoked, the more production there was of hyaluron hyaluronic acid, which is a uh, gag um, that we spoke about earlier. So there was more deposition of that. So there's a dose dependent relationship here. And secondly, as you guys can see, as compared to the control, people who smoked had a significantly larger amount of um, adipogenesis in the eye, which was also one of the contributing causes in the uh, pathogenesis of TED. So these two things combined, the excess fat tissue production, as well as the excess gag deposition, clearly show that smoking impacts the progression of TED a lot. Now, finally, so what did we do with the chef? Essentially, we advised that he stopped smoking. Um, we prescribed selenium. Um, carbimazole 
10 milligrams because as you guys saw, um, his T4 was reducing rapidly. It started off with 54, then it came down to 20, then it came down into the normal range. So we didn't want to go with a 40 milligram. And so we started at a low dose. We know it's Graves' disease because he was thyroid um, antibody positive, but we started with a low dose and eventually he will tighten it down further. We safety netted by letting him know that one of the side effects could be neutropenia. Um, and we have booked him a follow-up clinic at the TED clinic, which is a thyroid eye disease clinic run at Charing Cross, which deals with ensuring that there's no progression of the symptoms as you go along and just keeping a closer eye on them. Um, and now I think Prof Miran is going to talk a bit about the EU. Yeah, that was really clear, really good. Do you want to go back a slide? I'll just ask the question first of all. So one of the problems about carbimazole, of course, as you know, is that it causes neutropenia. Now, neutropenia with carbimazole means zero, okay? No neutrophils at all. If you've got a mild neutropenia at the start, it doesn't matter because you've got an immune system that works. Um, so I only worry when the, when, the, when the neutrophil count is less than 0 0.1. Um, other guidelines say 0 0.5, but if it's more than one, then they're normal. And you, because you're right, Graves does make your white count fall a bit. Uh, if your free T4 is greater than 50, it's Stephanie's question, yeah? Stephanie, is that right? Greater than 50. Do you want to unmute for a second? To... But if you have a free T4 greater than 50 and you don't do anything, that patient might come to quite a lot of harm. So you will need to quite urgently beta block them. And if they have asthma, then you can't do that. Uh, and then you start on high dose antithyroid drug, either PTU or carbimazole. Um, and that will make a big difference. But the carbimazole won't really make them feel better for about a month. So the beta blocker really is really helpful. So I would definitely go with that. Okay, it, thank you. Yeah. And you say restart. So when you say, do you mean you stopped it and restarting it? Yeah, so this guy I saw recently had a background of graves. Um, he stopped his carbimazole by himself a couple of months back. Okay. Um, so yeah. I guess the question of restarting it when he, uh, he given that he was viral with symptoms yeah. and had neutrophils of like 1.1. Yeah, it's fine. He, he, what he needs is his antithyroid drug with confidence. The problem, of course, is the reason we have quite a lot of non-compliance is that we hit carbamazole, nothing happens. You don't feel better. The beta blocker works, so they like that. Um, but you need to explain to them it will take a month to work and keep taking it every day and then eventually... Uh, they come under control. Um, Ty, do you want to go back a couple of slides to that nice picture of the Graves orbitopathy? Because that's really quite good. You've got some, another one? Yeah, this. So, so we have now got, um, yeah, I'll tell you, it was like Harry in a minute. <laughs> it might be different reference ranges because some countries are using milligrams. So I suspect that's what it was because we didn't have a reference range on that result. Mm -hmm. Um, but the antibody is, is positive with us, so he has got great disease. Now, the antibodies are quite interesting. So, so we have uh, become one of the European centres for thyroid eye disease. There's five in the UK and about 25 in Europe. And um, basically, they, they like to have a centre where there's a big endocrine unit and a big eye unit. We've got Western Eye and we've got here, Charing Cross, where the uh, ophthalmology department see our patients. And this curve, this Ronald's curve is really quite important because what happens, this patient has presented probably at the end of that brown bit of the curve because he's, he's not got any inflammatory features. So annoyingly for him, he's been through it all. He said he's been going for a year. So the inflammation has happened. He would have had an inflamed eye early on, but it was only in one eye. And there was a question, it very commonly occurs in, in one eye first. Um, because the other causes of exophthalmia are very rare. So for example, a retroorbital tumour is very, very, very rare. Graves disease is very, very common. So it's very likely that if someone presents with unilateral eye disease, exophthalmos, that it's still going to be Graves. Um, and um, so the treatment of an inflammatory thyroid eye disease is get seen urgently in the TED clinic where they will start very high dose steroids. And that reduces the inflammation. And if you can terminate inflammation before the gray line starts, then you prevent permanent 
um, effect on the eye. So it's really quite important to get in early. I mean, we've missed the boat with this guy completely because he's gone past that red bit and he's burnt out, as they say, and the fibrosis is there. So he's going to look like that unless they operate, which is what they do. So the management of these patients is start with methyl bread um, intravenously. So we admit them to once a week and they have a 12-week course of uh, methyl bread. It's a huge dose and the eye doctors, but it works. It definitely reaches the inflammation very quickly. They get loads of side effects. All the things that I talk about about steroids come out with that dose, but it works on the eyes. And if you can stop the inflammation before fibrosis sets in, then you're doing some permanent goodness. So that's really quite important. The antibodies, the, the fact that he had eye disease before he had thyroid eye disease, before he had Graves like thyroid disease, um, suggests, and there's some evidence for the fact that there's four, three or four different antibodies. So there's one antibody that causes exophthalmos, and there's a different antibody that causes hyperthyroidism, and there's a different one that causes, as you showed earlier, pre tibial myxedema. You mentioned the glycosaminoglycans growing. Do you want to go back a slide? I think it was the one before this. The one with those, yeah, that one. Yeah, so this pre tibial myxedema is caused by a different antibody. So most people get the Graves antibody for the thyroid first, and they present to us the endocrine unit with palpitations and the abnormal TFTs. And then Randall's curve comes in. Just go forward one. Again, yeah. And then that curve happens. The eye starts to become inflamed. And so I take them around to the eye clinic and they then carefully examine them to confirm there is inflammation. There were all kinds of funny equipment and they often do MRI orbits to look at which muscles are inflamed. There's a certain pattern. And if it is inflammatory, then they start high dose steroids. And sometimes they're gone to mycophenolate, so really quite potent immunosuppression to really get that curve down. Uh, but if you miss the boat like we have in this guy, we're going to have to operate. So we have to wait till it's burnt out, the other option, and then surgically intervene to make the patient's eye decompress. Sometimes it's slight threatening if the pressure's behind the eye. Um, but other, other times it's just cosmetic. I say just cosmetic to the patients. Some patients find it very distressing to have starey eyes, especially one starey eye. So, and then the last thing I want to say is that we are just about to get involved in some phase two and phase three MABs, monoclonal antibodies against the growth factors behind the eye. And um, these trials look like they will suppress the growth. And so we don't we need to use bread and methyl we have bread, we can use these things. Um, okay, there's another couple of questions. So radio, the other interesting thing is, as, as uh, Fahad said, smoking definitely worsens eye disease. There's no question about it. Now. There's lots of trials and data. And then there's also an intervention trial that was carried out some years ago by UGOGO, by the European Group on Graves of Thermopathy, that's what UGOGO stands for. And um, basically, they randomized patients to different treatments, radio iodine, medical treatment, and so on. And if you're a smoker and you have Graves' eye disease, then radioiodine has a 6% chance of worsening that. So it's quite widely known now amongst um, eye specialists that you don't want to use radioiodine in someone who's got bad Graves' eye disease if they smoke because it gets worse. Having said that, they also gave them a course of steroids, so half of them got steroids. And if you got steroids with your radioiodine, then the eyes got better. So um, you can use um, radio iodine in Graves' eye disease for the Graves' thyroid, but you need to also give them, we need to do it with steroid cover to make sure the eyes don't get worse. And sometimes if they're really inflamed, um, the ophthalmologist won't let us use radio iodine at all. And then we have to use surgery. But if they haven't got eye disease, uh, we do quite a lot of radio iodine here at Charing Cross. So we have probably, I don't know, one or fortnight Graves' patient who goes and has a dose of radio iodine, which ablates the thyroid gland and cures them, and they end up on thyroxin. Good, any other questions about uh, Graves' eye disease? Good question. Can smoking cessation help slow down progression of TED? The, so what we don't know, if from an evidence point of view, we don't know how long you need to stay off smoking before you have some benefit. It's a suggestion, 
that it's seven years. And the, of course, it's not like smoking and lung disease where you definitely get an improvement when you stop. The problem is the inflammatory cytokines, I don't know what makes them start and stop. Smoking clearly worsens them. So how long you need to be off cigarettes before you can, you can say um, that it won't affect you, I don't know. I know that Vicky Lee is very aggressive with patients who smoke. I mean, she will refuse to operate on you if you smoke. Then her argument is if you smoke, then I'll put it on your eye and make it all better. And you smoke and make it worse again. We've lost it all. So, so she's very uh, aggressive with smokers. The first thing she tells them is to stop smoking before anything else. Good. Let me see if there's any other questions or anything. Otherwise, quick reminder, please, can you sign my petition? You haven't done that already. It's in that reminder. Three. Yeah. Um, have you spoken about the frequency of carbamazole when they first come in? And the choice of beta blocker that you might use. I haven't, and that's a good point. Um, I'm a bit, I'm a bit reluctant to overemphasize what that there's a right way of doing it, right? So what, what? First of all, there are lots of right ways of doing this. Oh, hang on. <laughs> there's, a, there's something from uh, stop smoking in radical lung cancer surgery has more of an impact than yeah. Well, there you go. So it's a very quick benefit um, for for lung cancer. So it does a frequency and dosing and so on. So um, when you are very thyrotoxic, you are, have a very, very active liver. And the liver, as you might remember, undertakes a thing called first pass metabolism. And anything you swallow goes into your gut and then down the portal vein into the liver. And most of it is consumed by first pass metabolism. And if that is increased when you're very hyperthyroid, when you give someone a dose of carbamazole, most of it disappears. So we need to give a high dose. And if they're really toxic, you need to give it frequently. So in the really toxic thyroid stormy patients, we give high dose carbamazole or PTU four to six times daily. I mean, that sounds insane, but you cannot get on top of it unless you keep giving it because you've got to overcome the first path of metabolism, right? And then as they get better, they end up usually on 20 twice a day or 40 once a day. And it's a balance between compliance and getting, getting it in. Because obviously if you make it very frequent as an outpatient and you lose compliance, you've actually not done them much of a favor. When you're very hyperthyroid, some patients just can't remember to do things. You know, they're all over the place mentally. So quite often I give people carbimazole if they're not very, if they need admission, then I tend to use carbamazole 40 milligrams once a day, but I know that 20 twice a day is more effective because it's better on the liver's first part of metabolism when you're very toxic. So that's why we use high dose doses of both. And the other drug then, we're going to talk about propranolol. Yes, obviously yes. propranolol is a very old fastened beta blocker. Why would you use that as opposed to a new one? Yeah, so the old, so propranolol is very broad spectrum in terms of beta receptors, beta one, beta two. And the reason is that thyroxine is also everywhere. It affects all the systems. We don't want a cardio selective thing because the thyroid is not cardio selective. Every part of you becomes switched on your gut, your heart, everything. So we don't want to have a specific block of one receptor. So propranolol does all of those things. Okay. And the thing to bear in mind is that T3, when it's very high, is a very potent beta receptor sensitizer. So your beta receptors are highly switched on. And so when you, when you give people uh, um, propranolol, you are doing the right thing. You're blocking that oversensitive receptor, very logical thing to do. And it works very quickly. But the beta blocker wears off because the liver's churning it up got a very high first half metabolism. So if you take 40 of propranolol, you probably end up with about one milligram in your circulation. So you need to take it three times a day. Um, and then interestingly, as time goes on, as the month goes on and the carbamazole starts to work and the thyroid then slows down, the liver will also slow down. And so that's why you need to halve the liver carbamazole from 40 to 20, or as Fahad said, you can just block and replace, you start to get, add in thyroxine. Because as time goes on, the carbamazole gets more and more effective because there's less and less fast first part metabolism. So if you give 40 milligrams of carbamazole to someone who's euthyroid, they'll become very hypothyroid because they've got no high 
first pass metabolism. So that's why I've got the protocol of 40. So my protocol is 40 for a month, 20 for a month, 10 for a month, and then five as a kind of maintenance for a year and a half. That's what I tend to do with carbimazole. In terms of crisis, uh, when you say, this is a question on the chat, if you have thyroid crisis, that means the patient needs admission because it means without treatment, there's a 50% mortality. So the thing about Graves' disease is it's very rare to die of it unless you've got thyroid storm, in which case it suddenly jumps up to 50%. So if you mismanage a Graves patient who's not got a storm, they'll, they'll be all right. But if you mismanage one of these people, they die. And so they need admission. They need a high intensity ideally of nursing care. So if they're very unwell, ideally on intensive care, I know that's really hard now. Uh, so, so AMU cope really well, in fact, very well. So that's a perfectly adequate place for, in fact, you've managed quite a few thyroid storms over the last uh, few months. And the trick is to give adequate beta block A to get their thyroid status back to safety. As soon as you beta block them, almost all of them I can think of have no longer actually been in storm. Uh, but there are second and third line treatments, which is very high dose antithyroid drug, six times daily. So inpatient, you can give it six times daily because there's no compliance issues. So beta blockade, then high dose antithyroid drugs. And then you need to think about where you're going to go, either down the radioiodine route or the surgical route. If it's surgical and the surgeons agree and the patient agrees, then you give them a 10 day course of potassium iodide, 65 milligrams TDS, and that will make the gland shrink and then the surgeons enjoy operating on those smaller glands. And if you're going down the radioiodine route, then you can use lithium carbonate for a few days and then operate if it's an urgent. Most patients though, once they've been beta blocked and had some antithyroid drugs are quite safe. Severe asthma is a nightmare. Um, that's a good option. The, the other thing is, I, I mean, I'm very, obviously I'm afraid of precipitating asthma. So we're in hospital and I use a tiny bit of a, B, a cardiac beta blocker and they are so much better that I've started taking that risk um, because of course the beta receptors are very, they're more sensitive than normal. And so I haven't had a crisis, but I'm always worried. So as an inpatient, I can do it. I never do it as an outpatient in asthmatic because I haven't got the safety of a intensive care unit just in case. Um, but yes, I do use, uh, sometimes you can use short acting Esmolol to see if it's all right. Um, but in general, they've got so much better with the beta blocker. The other very interesting thing is they can be breathless with heart failure and their tachycardia. And the beta blocker work, makes them better, actually improves their blood pressure because they're so fast. When you slow them down, they get a beta, a better, um, cardiac output a better um pulse volume so yeah but severe asthma i i do the same but with a bit more anxiety and much more supervision of the patient that's an important question thank you adam good thank you very much that was a really uh, i really enjoyed those slides on the autoimmune thing because that's really quite interesting and in the future you'll start hearing about um you'll start hearing about these new maps that are coming out no concern general about b levels in pure oh is that right richard do you want to say anything more about that this is quite important well, i was just trying to find the mute button um yeah so if people have got fixed airways uh, obstruction. Um, generally, COP COPD uh, beta blockers long term are um, a good idea, and there's actually right. mortality benefit because the patients with COPD actually die from cardiac disease. Um, obviously, if there's any doubts, just discuss with um, one of us. But um, as, yes. long as, not, as long as it's not mixed with asthma as well, if it's pure COPD. Uh, beta blockers shouldn't, shouldn't cause any problems. That's really helpful. And of course, a lot of patients are a bit older. And if they're smokers as well, um, they're likely to have COPD. So that's very helpful. Thank you. 